<laughs> okay, so welcome. I'm Megan Abbott, um, and this is Mia Khalifa. Some of you may recognize her, some of you may not. Turns out a lot of you do. <laughs> As I have found out via text and DM saying, oh, where are you hanging out with Mia Khalifa? How do you know Mia Khalifa? Well, funny story. Are you okay we tell the funny yes, story? Yes, of course. So, uh, Mia, I know her first professionally. Uh, and if you don't know me, I'm a life coach and a business coach. Um, and so I started working with Mia uh, via my fiance, Joseph. And, you know, I knew she was sort of a big deal. She's got a few followers on Instagram. How many followers? A couple. Uh, 15 million? 15 million. That's with a capital M. <laughs> um, and so you may be thinking, if you don't know who Mia is, well, God, how and why do you have 15 million followers? How are you so famous? You're such a big deal. Um, and what would be the headline as to why you have 15 million followers, do you think? Uh, I would say my past. Yes which is what we're here to talk about today. And so I knew key facts about your past and why you're famous. I didn't Google you. I didn't look into you. I don't really care. I don't really want to know, right? I want to get to know you yeah. as a human being and a person, which is what I've had the great privilege to get to do. Um, and then within our work uh, recently, it came up uh, this interview that happened, right, in L.A., was that? Or is it a radio? Oh, it was a radio interview in Florida. Yeah, a radio interview. Your home state. Okay, don't hold it against me. We <laughs> bath salts for appetite. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, actually what's in here right now, just yeah. in case. And in here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't just until you try it and eat somebody's face off. We digress. Uh, <laughs> so, do you want to show what happened on this interview? Because I really think it's an important impetus for this us here uh, yeah. in this conversation. So normally my manager will prep any um, interviewer or any uh, show I'm going on by giving them key things not to talk about, like talking points that are not okay, intros that are not okay. And he dropped the ball on this one. And this was two, no, three days after I had had surgery. So I was a little drugged up, actually a lot drugged up. And when I am on like a cocktail of all of these pills, mm -hmm. I am a little more loose with what I say. So they introduced me first by talking about another adult film actress saying, oh, this one time I was at a basketball game and I forgot what name they used, insert generic alliterated name here, mm -hmm. uh, was sitting in front of me. And, you know, she was yelling at the basketball players like, hey, I know you recognize me. I know you recognize me, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the host goes on to say, and that was the first time I realized porn stars like sports. And to segue into this interview, we have Mia Khalifa, a porn star who is also into sports. That touched such a nerve with me because I have a more prolific sports career than this daytime radio host. Like mm -hmm. I've hosted a show with a former NBA All-Star. I've had a second sports show with a former ESPN and um, Major League Baseball radio host. So when he introduced me as a porn star, I felt a mixture of emotions. One was a huge cloud of shame because me being on their show and basically to their audience allowing them to call me that sets a terrible tone for me which is uh acceptance and pride in my past mm. which i i neither of those things have come to me yet the pride or the acceptance i'm still working on the acceptance because it is what it is but i'm definitely not proud of it mm -hmm. um the bigger thing though was i immediately wanted to make them feel as small as they made me feel. Mm -hmm. So I could have handled it a lot better. Mm -hmm. I will say that. Mm -hmm. um, and 
in the in the long run, it got them what they wanted. They right. wanted the views. They didn't get you know they hit the dump button fast enough. It right. didn't actually make it to the uh, to the radio, but. Yeah. yeah, it was it was the shame that made me act that way. Yes. And so so then Mia comes back, right? We have a session and with her uh, esteemed team and we say, you know, look, I think that this is a problem that we need to be able to talk about, not just for business uh, and then moving forward for you to be able to say, yeah, I did porn or for somebody else to say that without having this massive wave of shame, you know, come over you, not just for your own health and peace and sanity, you know, to be able to make peace with your past, um, but then also to be able to move forward. And so I, I completely understand. In fact, I remember in our first session, you said to me, we were talking about goals. Goals are very 101 in coaching. You know, this is where you're at. Where do you want to be? Let's start to move forward towards that. And so in that first conversation, remember, we we're talking about, okay, what do you want? You know, what would excite you? What are your goals professionally, personally? Uh, and I remember that you said, you know, my goal is to do an interview or to, you know, have an article written where it doesn't say porn star, right? Where you have established and achieved, you know, something where, you know, Kim Kardashian in a sex tape, like nobody is saying, you know, whatever they said, right, about her, where she, her reputation and what she's known for has transcended beyond that, that that's her goal. And I thought, shit, that's a great goal to have good. Let's move towards it. But I think that the way, as I've learned more, that you have approached that is, don't talk about it, you know? Yeah. Like, don't mention it, don't talk about it. Maybe people will forget, but it seems like people aren't forgetting. No. <laughs> and so, hence then, you know, this sit down where we said, I, I think that you need to be able to talk about it, to be able to, which I actually think is a huge part of our own healing with shame, a really powerful word you used. Um, and one of the reasons I started to get excited about being able to sit down and talk to you and interview and, you know, and film it so that other people could see is because as human beings, we all have shame. Every single one of us has some sort of shame and maybe you've done a better job at you know healing it or moving past it. Um, but at some point you have shame and you most likely still do now. And I think a lot of us as human beings are craving freedom ultimately, right? We have lots of goals that we think we want, but ultimately what we want is this sense of, of freedom in our life and I actually think that that dealing, being able to deal with our shame is the biggest thing that will set you free. That when you have made peace, you know, and looked at your demons, your skeletons in the closet to say, hey, guy, I see you, right? You're there, but you don't scare me anymore. That then think about the power of that, that, you know, other people no longer have over you to affect you. Right. It is something that you've done. It's not who you are, which is, you know, another thing that I hope that people get to see in this is, you know, get to know you and who you are, uh, which I consider to be a fantastic human being. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so what I would love to do if you're up for it is to actually hear a little bit more about your story and going back actually to like you have a pretty interesting beginning to your life and story. And I think it all kind of weaves together and plays a part to, you know, you here and sitting on this, you know, prestigious couch <laughs> and on this prestigious show. This is very buttery You leather. made it. Congratulations. <laughs> you made it. I don't think this is real, but, you know, for animal as rights. As long as it's not black and <laughs> board casting in front of it. <laughs> yeah. We're, animals are our friends. So, um, so why don't you tell me about, like, what's your earliest memory? I was trying to think of this the other day for me. My earliest memory. Yeah. Um, oh, that actually, I'm trying to think. Because there's a few that stand out. I'm trying to think which one probably came first. They're, they're all in Lebanon. And they all involve food. <laughs> um, Shocking. And how old were you when you moved? I was around 10 years old. Okay. So do you remember, like, living? Yeah, I remember there? school. I remember everything. I went to a French private school, uh, a Catholic school. Um, called Senko, and I remember my friends there, and I remember uh, 
I remember my my neighbor who was like my best friend at the time, like my childhood friend, his name was Fadi, and we used to go ride bikes together and I used to uh, like hide his toys and anytime he would bring something over, I would like hide it under my bed. So then he'd like have to come back the next day and be like, hey, where's that toy? Oh, it's here. Like, should we just play? <laughs> Basically, now that you're here. yeah. Basically, you want how food? Food? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that you're here, maybe you should stay. Yeah. What would you? What would be like the theme of of your childhood? Like the kind of the word, the feeling, the theme. If you had to put one to it, mm. up to ten. Freedom. Mm. Freedom. Because when I moved to America, that was no longer the word. Ironically. Yeah. Huh. The land of freedom. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think it was also because it was such a big culture shock to move for my parents. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the country. They didn't know the culture. They didn't know anybody here, really. So they didn't trust most people. So I wasn't allowed to just go to a friend's house or, you know, go play in the park like all of the other kids. Like, my parents were very scared and overprotective. So as soon as we got to America... Up until the day I left for college, I just felt like there was a chokehold on me, a proverbial wow. chokehold, yeah. uh, where I couldn't do anything. I couldn't breathe to the point where I felt the need to rebel and need to do something just so crazy to rectify all those years of not being able to do anything. Do you remember like the actual moving process? Do you yeah. know what was happening? No, of course, of okay. course. Like okay. I had to say bye to all my friends oh, and family. I remember packing. I remember packing my little backpack to take on the flight with me of like all my toys and stuff. What do you remember feeling during the trip? Very excited. Okay, that's what I would have always for loved you because you're like an adventurous yeah. person. I've always loved uh, traveling and being on airplanes because I don't. I I don't know. I like new experiences, and as a kid. An airplane was definitely like a new experience. And so then you get here and then tell me about life and adjusting to uh, life. And, and where did you live? D.C. Okay. Yeah. Um, we landed on January 1st, 2001. Uh, barely spoke English. I was in ESOL. Uh, and I remember I came in halfway through the school year because we landed in January. And the next year, the start of the school year, we started in very late August, like around August 30th or something. Um, I had, you know, learned English. Uh, I still had a very heavy accent, though. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, oh, this is my year. This is when I'm going to start making friends. I'm going to have American friends, et cetera, et cetera. And two weeks later, 9-11 happens. Welcome to America. Yeah, and this wasn't in like two weeks Wisconsin. later. Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. It, this wasn't like Wisconsin. DC was personally affected. Like I went to school with kids whose parents worked in the Pentagon. Yeah. So I was immediately the terrorist. And that was my nickname well, all through high school. People would call you to your face. Kids are sure. fucking mean. I know. You know this. Come on. I know, but I want... What I, did they call you? I, you were tall as shit. What did they call you? Cool tall girl. <laughs> Something like that. Must be nice to be pretty. <laughs> no. You want to see pictures? I do, actually. <laughs> I will show you pictures. Yeah, just cool. like bring it up slowly. <laughs> bring up her and me. Okay. All right. So, yes. Right after you get here, 9-11. But, I mean, I, I want to know. Like, I'm walking in with you to school and you're excited. Like... Oh, America! Hey, but I was I still, I was still the same like terror that I always was. So were nothing. You, do you remember feeling nervous or just excited? Like you're anticipating good things. Excited because I'm always fa falsely confident about things. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Like, even yeah. if I shouldn't be, I'm yeah. falsely confident, yeah. and that just got torn down through How soon? elementary school pro after the terrorist yeah. the, everything, um, and then through middle school, I. I got boobs like that immediately. Really? In like the sixth grade. And then the rest of me started to fill out uh, more than I would have intended. You're like, wait a minute, I thought I was supposed yeah. to go like this. Yeah, exactly. Instead of going like happening. this. I look like the blueberry from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, good. Um, and then I get to high school and I'm not really, you know, I, I, I'm kind of in that weird middle class where I know the popular kids. And I'm cool with, like, one or two of them, but we, like, don't hang out outside of school. I'm not really 
a loser. I just have no place in high school. I, I don't know my place. I had one friend all through high school. And was it a boy or a girl? It was a girl. Her name was Becky. And um, her and I were completely inseparable. Hmm. Um, and then after my freshman year, I went to military boarding school. Mm. Uh, Why? Because boarding, uh, better education. Public schools okay. are terrible. That's military good. boarding school is where I started to thrive. Because, and this is weird, I, you know, felt very constricted at home. But military boarding school, I felt free. I felt like I was a part of something bigger than myself, and yeah. it was so nice. Yeah, yeah, I bet. After how many years before that? Yeah, I didn't yeah. know my place in America, and in, in you know, in school, in even in my family, because I was the only one who was, you know, Lebanese born and raised. Everybody spoke Arabic, but I was also becoming Americanized. Hmm. So you could feel, and maybe even before that, because you're this wild child, but so, so you felt this sense of kind of like, oh, I'm not the same as you. I don't, I don't fit in here. Absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Absolutely. My, yeah, no. And do you remember struggling with that or just being aware of it? Or maybe just liking being, that you stand Just being out? aware of it. Okay. Being aware of it. Yeah. And kind of using it to fuel my rebellion a little bit. And so then you graduate from high school, and what yeah. happens? I uh, go to college, and in college, uh, so in, in military school, we took extra classes. Like, I lived there in the summer, too, and all of those extra classes were college credits. Hmm. So I was able to graduate college in three years because I had three years of high school, you know, college credits earned. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to UTEP. Uh, graduated, got out of there as fast as possible because there was nothing in El Paso. Um, and I because I was on a fast track to graduating, I was very focused on school. I also didn't have very many friends in college. Um, I didn't party very much. I, you know, didn't go to the house parties and, you know, do the normal college things because it's also El Paso. Like, it's not a party school. Everyone there is from El Paso. What Most, made you choose there? They accepted, I applied to UT Austin. And they recommended me to UT El Paso because they would have, they accepted all of the credits I had earned. Oh. Um, and I didn't want to do the full four years. So I was like, fuck it. It's only three years. Yeah. It was like um, a means to an end. Yeah, like, exactly. Get, in, get out. Yeah. Do what you need. Get like, what do you I study? History. Why? Because history was fun for me. And I knew that if I was going to be like this laser focused, I wanted something that would captivate me for the entire time. And mm -hmm. it did. But I also graduated and I was like, well, fuck, I don't want to teach. What am I going to do? So when you were choosing a major, right, what you're going to focus on, you weren't thinking like. What I didn't know what that. I wanted to do, what yeah. I wanted to be, what I, I had no five or 10 year plan. I just wanted to get a degree and get, get it over with as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and history was interesting, interesting and fun. Yeah. Um, so after college, I moved to Miami. All through college, so I, I had I started to lose weight my senior year of high school, and the weight loss continued all through college until I got to be about no, I was way skinnier than this actually. I got down to like 98 pounds, uh, and because I was eating extremely unhealthy, I was like it was bad, I was not eating basically. Uh, I gained a little bit of weight back, but the first thing to go was my boobs, mm. and my boobs were. Probably, I still have my, like, bra from high school, just because I like to hold it up sometimes and go, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was a 36E, and now I'm a 32E in high school. But I was also huge. Huge is a relative term. 36 versus 32. I know. Well, that's, that's what I'm like, thinking of, like, I'm a 36. I'm like, huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the first thing to go was my boobs. And it wasn't just like, oh, now I have tiny perky oh, yeah, boobs. I, like, <laughs> I looked like I had four kids and I was, <laughs> what, 20 years old? It was so detrimental to my self-esteem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hated being in a bikini. Like, I couldn't wear certain things. I couldn't even wear a bra without, like, the excess skin showing. Uh, so through college, I saved up for breast augmentation. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I chose Miami was actually because... Uh, I knew I didn't want to live in California, but the best doctors 
for that are in Beverly Hills. But the second best place is Coral Gables in Miami. Mm. Um, I couldn't afford to like fly to Beverly Hills, stay there for a week to recover, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. what I wanted to do was do it in a place where I lived. And after I got to Miami about uh, like four to six months into living there uh, is when I made the appointment. The entire time I was, you know, doing consultations, weighing out which doctor I wanted to go to, all that stuff. And finally, I chose the doctor, got it done. And I woke up from the surgery and I was like, wow, I'm pretty. Really? Yes. Is that the first time you can remember feeling pretty? Yes. But it was a very unhealthy kind of pretty, like a pretty where I needed to be told I was pretty. Like I needed that attention because I never got it in high school and I didn't really get it in college because I dressed extremely frumpy because I was self-conscious about the way I looked from, I, I mean, I was losing a lot of weight, but I couldn't wear tank tops. I couldn't, you know, everything I wore was like a t-shirt because my boobs just looked so bad in everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just craved male attention. Yeah. Healthy or unhealthy. Like it didn't matter. I just... I, yeah. I needed male attention. I think every woman craves to feel attractive. Yes. But I think that a lot of feminists uh, reject that, right? Because we're so often like the, the story is like that that's the patriarchy controlling us, that our value is our, our beauty, you know, our sexuality or our aesthetics, you know, so it becomes this kind of convoluted like, oh, I want to be pretty, but is that bad? Do I want to be pretty? And I think we all as human beings, you know, want to feel significant, special, wanted. There's something about us, right, that is desirable. That is part of human nature. Yeah. And if you don't have it, I mean, we all will find a way to do it, whether it's being a rebel, right, can be part of it. Whether it's our sexuality, um, you know, our bodies, whether it's our quick wit or intellect, maybe a lot, right, if we're multifaceted and talented. <laughs> um, but we all have to have something that's like, why am I wanted? And the more I can find something that people really want, the more we're going to do and pursue it, right? Okay, good. So now back to Miami, the boobs, the emergence. Yes. You feel this, I'm attractive. Walk me through it. Uh, were there lots of bikinis at this point? Well, it was Miami, of course. Okay, it's like I could not wait to be like fully bikini. healed and able to wear them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, like three... Three weeks to four weeks after my surgery, I was walking uh, down the street in Miami. Uh, it was just like a shop. I was actually walking across from a Pier 1 Imports to like a restaurant across the shopping center. Mm -hmm. And a car literally stops dead on its tracks mm -hmm. and rolls the window down. And they're like, you are so gorgeous. Would you like to model for me? Like, can I give you my card? And, you know, me, I'm like, me? Are you serious? Really? Yeah. Me? Yeah. So I take their card and I go home and I look at it and I Google what it is and it's a porn company. So in my head, I was like, oh, what the fuck? But wait, mm -hmm. maybe like he told me I was pretty. Mm. Maybe I'll just go in and like talk to them and see what it's about. So like two weeks later, uh, I gave him a call and I was like, yeah, I'd like to come in and like take a tour of the offices and, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. ask some questions. Mm -hmm. So it was a beautiful office, too. So I go in and he gives me the tour. And they're all just so nice and so friendly. Everyone there is so sweet. There's a lot of women working there. Mm. Uh, he just worked in like, you know, video editing and mm -hmm. talent management, all of like the production and uh film crew they were they were all women mm -hmm. um so that immediately made me feel very comfortable uh and that was just like from that point it was a whirlwind after i said yes and but did you in that meeting say yes or was it something you like thought about oh i thought about it for two weeks before i even okay. called him to mm -hmm. take a meeting but like once i was in there and everyone was telling me how pretty I was. And, you know, I saw how nice everyone was. I was like, well, yeah, it didn't feel like yeah. skeezy. It felt exactly. like, like this business yeah. is your normal people. Oh, this must be like a... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's not It's not the, you know, motel porn right. that people think right. in their head. This is a multi-million dollar corporation. Are you like 
Do you have somebody close to you that you're saying like, is this crazy? I'm thinking about this. Are you telling anybody no, this? No, nobody. Completely because in my head, I went into it like, oh, I'm sure like people do this all the time. This will just be my dirty little secret. Like, who the fuck am I? Who, who am I? Like, I have 400 friends on uh, Facebook and like 200 followers on Instagram. Like, no one's no one's gonna ever know. Was Instagram? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Instagram yeah, yeah, yeah. was, was already pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you're thinking like dirty little secret. Yes. You have this like rebellious side. Yes. In like an way. alter ego that could yeah. be, you know, fun and a chance to let loose and no one's ever going to find out about it. Any other thoughts that went into this like equation? Yes, definitely the safety aspect of it. Okay. And uh, I will say they're very vigilant about testing. Okay. You're good. not allowed to shoot un unless you've been tested. Good. Uh, both parties. Mm -hmm. um, so that made me feel better. Um. And that was like my main concern, people uh, finding out and the safety aspect. Okay. And once those were like, you know, I poorly reasoned them off in my head. Yeah. Not the safety aspect, that one you're covered. Right. But, you right. know, the people finding out thing. Yeah. Uh, it was very naive of me. But what would you say prior to that was your kind of relationship to sex? Was it this big deal? Was it this dirty thing? Was it this? No, it was just like, it. it's a, to me it was, always a very natural thing and um a very uh primal thing yeah and i felt like well i mean everybody has sex yeah. like who doesn't have sex we're all yeah. here because of sex yeah um hmm. you don't need to love someone to have sex with them like it like people you just need to be attracted to them and like it, there's a difference between just wanting it and wanting to be with someone. And I always mm. knew that difference. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it was like, um, I was A, okay with there being other people in the room and B, okay with, also, you don't just like go on set and you're like, hey, nice to meet you. All right, take your pants off. Like, yeah. they're, the Males are very professional and they know that it's not going to be a good scene unless they make the female connection. comfortable. No, not even a connection. They just try to make okay, her comfortable. Right, right, They're right, not right. like flirting with you or anything, right. but they will go into the green room beforehand and like talk to you and make you feel okay. And they're like, hey, if there's anything that you're not comfortable with, just like, let me know. Like, I'm, this is your, this is your show. Like, I, whatever you want is okay. Whatever you don't want is fine. Uh, you know, they'll like, Tell you a little bit about themselves, just make you feel comfortable, which was very nice. Yeah. Um, are you nervous? What's your state like day of? Day of, I felt very pampered. You had hair and makeup. You had, you know, uh, they gave you like 20 different menus to choose from. And like they sent someone out to get your lunch or like your coffee or a smoothie or whatever you want for the whole day. And you got to like play dress up and try on all of these things. And hmm. it was it was fun. I had never done that before. And all of the attention was on yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And that made me feel validated and beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. The like the actual scene mm -hmm. was, I, I barely remember Do you it. like kind of blacked it out, was like, out about it? Yeah. yeah. It only took about like 15 minutes to film anyway. Yeah. Uh, what took like four hours was hair and makeup, choosing the, uh, the you know, outfits, everything like that. Um, also... There was only one other person in the room, and it was the camera person. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's not like what you're, what people usually think of. Like, there's 20 people not in like the room. Not like this big production here. Yeah, we have like 15 people in here. <laughs> hey, Joe, Sally. Yeah, hey, get my uh, coffee ready yeah, for Yeah, can after. I get a refill? Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yes. Okay, so, yeah, interesting. One person there. Kind of, so, but, and for you... Can't even really remember. It was kind no. of like a blackout, which definitely. I, think I feel like all of them were actually like yeah. blackouts. Yeah. Every single one, um, which is probably my. After the first time, it, that should have been my brain telling me this is probably not a good thing. Yeah. Um, so that went on for about three, four months. In that time, short time. In that very short time of like the day of i felt validated and pretty and it would wear off okay because it was false yeah and that kept on happening every time um the turning point of course was when i made when i did the hijab scene the scene in uh wearing yeah. the uh hijab yeah uh that is when 
the ISIS death threats came in, um, all of the news broke out globally, not just in America. Yeah. Uh, it was picked up by CNN, Fox News, Newsweek did uh, a cover story, not a cover story, but a huge profile on it. Um, every USA Today, every single major outlet that you can think of, it was on it. It was trending on Twitter. It was all over the news. Um, I was banned from certain, from like a handful of countries. Uh, I think it was like Egypt and uh, Afghanistan. And, you know, very Muslim countries uh, were deeply offended by it. And I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. So to me, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, this is bad. What I actually said when they proposed the scene to me, and this is verbatim, was you motherfuckers are going to get me killed. Oh, good. Verbatim is what I said to them. But you said that tongue-in-cheek, right? You didn't actually think this is going to be... Like, I, what said did it, you think? I said it very tongue-in-cheek. Right. Um, because people like didn't know like at that you point. thought it would be controversial yes i assume absolutely right? but not obviously what it yeah. became as soon as like the day after the scene dropped is when everything blew up i think i went from 400 followers on instagram to like 200,000 in the span of 3 days and then it just kept snowballing until i was at like 2 million uh, like 6 months later okay. and this was after i had i had quit porn yeah it just kept growing and growing and growing and then my instagram account was hacked by isis okay a lot of facts here but i want to back up because this is like a series of things that you're saying like which are all a huge deal when films scenes when it's coming out are you is there is anybody recognize you is there any change in your life or lifestyle before the big bang so yes before the big bang uh proverbial big bang and i guess literal uh um i people my my friends from back home started to find out because somebody found the first scene uh -huh. and they sent it to everybody so that I had, I was already about to film the one with the hijab that basically went viral and mm -hmm. global. Mm -hmm. uh, it was going to happen that week. So I was like, well, you know, I can't, I can't back out. So I guess this next one will be, you know, it because people are starting to find out. Um, and after that one, wow. After that one came out the following week, uh, it was beyond repair. But before that, your family hadn't known. No. Some friends, and you knew. Would they contact you and say like, uh, "No"? How did you know that they knew? My friends. Yeah, your friends. Your because friends. people talk. I know, like, but people they would, would talk to you. Was yeah. did you have a confidence saying like, "Hey"? No, this. no. People would like send me and be like, "Oh my god, is this you?" So, yeah, that you know, the shame started to set in a little bit. So the reality before there's like a disconnect, yes. right? Kind of like an out of body. This thing you're doing, it's yes. private. And then, like, a reality starts to sink yeah. in. A fear. a fear. A fear of, shame. like, things starting to change and people starting to think things of me. Um, mm -hmm. So next was the hijab scene. And I thought that one would be, you know, one of my last ones. Or probably my last one. And the following week, that one came out. And instantly, it was like wildfire. All of the news outlets picked it up. Every publication, every blog, it started to trend on Twitter. Uh, ISIS sent me death threats. How? Via what means? Medium. They photoshopped a picture of me on a beheaded body holding, holding like my head that was photoshopped on there, saying, you'll be next, you Muslim disgrace. Like, I'm, I'm Catholic, dude. Yeah. I go to Ash Wednesday. Yeah. You don't want me. I already have guilt issues. Yeah, exactly. I've got Catholic guilt. You think that? <laughs> yeah. Like, you can affect me? Yeah. No. Okay, but what is the reality of when you see... So this is something that's released online. It's not like dropped in your inbox, yes. right? You see this picture. What is the reality of like seeing yourself on this? So I responded to it and I said, better my head than my tits. They were expensive. Okay, good. And you're very good at Thank these you. witty deflections to protect yourself. But the reality... Witty or stupid, because a week after that, I had a Google image uh, screenshot. Like a no. Oh, God, no. 
Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Jesus of what? Christ. Of uh, a Google Im- a Google Maps image of my apartment on Twitter and utter fear set in. I lived in a hotel for like two weeks and I moved after I was able to like, you know, get my things together and, you know, find a new place. But uh, that was one of the scariest. That was m- way more scary than the be- the beheading Photoshop. Why? Did it just feel like, oh, this is just empty threats. You, you can't really get to me. Exactly. Okay. But once... You, like, you know, know where, where I live. Are. Now you feel like really exposed yes. and violated. And Absolutely. And, yeah. And so at that time, again, do you have like a support unit? So at around the same time, CNN contacted my parents for comment. And I, I thought about it a lot. And I was like, okay, well, if everybody in the world knows about this, I guess the only thing to do is keep doing it mm. um but it, it wasn't me like it, it it never felt authentic or genuine and i was never that into it or that into the fame aspect of it or the infamy aspect not fame yet mm-hmm. uh so i continued to do it for about two months and at a certain point I said, I, I actually turned in a resignation letter because I was signed on as a contract girl after that scene. Hmm. It was terrifying because I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I had a huge gap period in my resume. Yeah, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was trying to lead a normal life while also maintaining my uh, online persona hmm. because it was financially beneficial to me Mm -hmm. and I really needed it Mm -hmm. so my first job after porn was a paralegal for an insurance defense firm (laughs) what why what and that was that just because like oh here's a job and I can get that did you know somebody no I literally went on what did you do there were you like an admin like a receptionist what were you doing basically I was the paralegal for the attorney just uh, you know, I scheduled, uh, you know, I submitted all of his court paperwork. I fielded phone calls. I scheduled all his meetings, got his lunch. Um, and then did they know who you were? Yes, Okay. they did. All of the men in the office knew who I was. Did they say stuff? One of them did. And it made me highly uncomfortable. And, you know, people would look at me weird. It wasn't a big office. It was, you know, six attorneys and one receptionist and six paralegals. Uh, So it was a small workplace, but six months into that job, they dissolved the company. It went Mm. under. Mm. Uh, So I had to find a new job. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that also, you know, being unemployed, lengthened the time that I kept the link in my bio and kept, you know, the whole online persona going i chopped all my hair off so i wouldn't get recognized in public i cut it to here and i dyed it blonde nothing worked really yeah you know i would wear and my manager can attest to this i will be in the baggiest clothes with my hair in a bun and sunglasses on walking down the street and a passing car will still yell out their window and recognize me and what is that like for you to now suddenly be famous after after the whole high of you know feeling validated because of porn wore off i immediately started to feel ashamed anytime a man would look at me a certain way Hmm. i could immediately sense that oh my god this person has seen me naked and i never want to give them the satisfaction of feeling like they have an attachment to me so I dressed extremely frumpy. I tried not to go out in public as much as I could. I hated being recognized when I was alone because it made me feel unsafe. You know, a few things have happened to me where people felt entitled to touch me in public because they felt like they knew me online or they thought that I was a certain way because I did porn Mm -hmm. or that, you know, I was okay with having my privacy invaded physically because I was you know, on camera, naked. So I, and 
ever since. Like, I, I hate leaving the house for now? that reason. Today? Yes, today and probably forever. I hate being looked at. I hate being noticed. I hate being uh, recognized. It makes me wildly uncomfortable. And it makes me scared to even like go get packages from my leasing office when I'm alone. Because anytime I can avoid having people recognize me, I will avoid it. And if that means never leaving my house, great. I love my dogs. I never have to leave my house. Wow. So I became very reclusive. Um, and after, you know, that two months of unemployment, I finally found another job. And I was a bookkeeper for a uh, construction general, contract, general contracting firm. Mm -hmm. And I was terrible. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Their books have never been. I, I think they're still trying to fix their books. After I me. cannot imagine. You. Oh, God, I feel so bad for them. Bless their hearts. Yeah. Um, Bless their hearts. <laughs> so, so doing that for, uh, I think I was at that job for about eight months when I hit a turning point in my life where I decided to accept it, accept who I am now, who my persona, yeah. my, you know, future and what I wanted to do. So I decided Miami was a toxic place because Miami is a toxic place. Mm -hmm. It's a very transient city. It's not a place to live and try and have a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, I knew some people in Austin and I came to visit Austin one weekend and that was kind of the turning point. Uh, two months later, I quit my job, packed up all my shit mm -hmm. and moved to Austin mm -hmm. and decided I'm going to try and rebuild. I'm going to try and change the narrative and I'm going to try and, you know, make a career doing my passions, which was sports and being a loud mouth mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> annoying people, mm -hmm. but mainly just sports. So I knew I was good at it. I knew people listened to me because even when I had my Instagram and Twitter, I would always be like live tweeting during games and talking all the shit that I could and people enjoyed it. Yeah. Anything else significant to you about, like, this three years in Austin? Yes, and absolutely. Uh, I think the biggest growth I had was my last two months in Miami and my first year in Austin. Um, I realized that, and I guess this just comes with getting older and being wiser and learning more about yourself, but I realized that all of the validation that I ever got from men was always temporary. Hmm. And I never in my life have felt more validated than when I did not have a boyfriend. I was not in a relationship and I was not talking to anybody. And I had time to grow as a person and learn myself and learn what my passions are and what I love. Because I, I was in a relationship after after I did porn mm -hmm. and it was a very unhealthy relationship. Not that he ever did anything wrong to me or treated me poorly. Mm -hmm. It was unhealthy in the sense that I relied on him mm -hmm. for my happiness and my validation. Mm -hmm. Like if he didn't tell me I was pretty that day, mm -hmm. was, was I pretty that day? Yeah. You know, it was kind of like that, mm -hmm. which is a terrible way to think as a young woman. Yeah. But I feel like everyone goes through that. Oh, and some people live there forever. Yeah. Right? Where my significance requires upon you telling me. And if you're not telling me, then... Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I actually my biggest uh, turning point was when I started to go to therapy. Because I wanted to... Uh, even though I didn't have one... Like, it's not like I, you know, had a relationship and I needed help fixing it. I had a shitstorm of many little problems that I wanted to... I, I wanted tools to take away and know how to fix them myself. But I needed someone's help to do that. Mm -hmm. So I started going to therapy mm -hmm. with your fiance and mm -hmm. that's how we met. Mm -hmm. And ever since my first session with him, I, I, I have not been the same person. Why, what do you think changed? I think I just needed somebody to tell me what to do mm. because I didn't know what the first step to take was. And the first thing he told me was, cut this bad person out of your life and validate yourself. You don't need him to validate you. Went away from that session, blocked them on every outlet that I could, on phone, email, 
social media, everything. Mm -hmm. Completely cut them out of my life. Mm -hmm. And that was the happiest week of my life because I wasn't sitting there wondering, oh, is he going to text me? Yeah. Oh, am I going to get a phone call today? Yes. That weight was lifted off my shoulders because I had the power. And it wasn't like I was using it as a ploy to try and like right. play games with him. It was kind of like... You took your power back. Exactly. It was That was very empowering. And session after session, I got you know, tools here and there and lessons to take away. And uh, I, actually, one of the biggest things was uh, to write. For a month straight, I wrote down three things that I'm thankful for in the morning. And then at night, I wrote down uh, three things that I had learned that day about myself. Wow. And I did that for a month straight. And it was very cathartic and a good, you know, habit to try and like, look back on the day and a bigger picture of like what I'm thankful for. And every day they would change and some day, some things would repeat. And I learned that, you know, those things hold more value to me. So I concentrated more on them. Mm -hmm. um, that really helped uh, me to grow as a person. Um, another thing was just not having any men in my life, mm. which was an incredible time to learn about myself and learn what I wanted and what I didn't want in a man. Mm -hmm. So I was single for about two years mm -hmm. uh, while I was in Austin and it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think every woman, I think every person, but especially every woman has to be able to have that time where you stand on your own and you figure yourself out yeah. and your happiness because otherwise a relationship, it always becomes that neediness. I yeah. need something from you, whether it's, my financial survival, my significance, my happiness. And that's not a relationship. That's not love. That's a business exchange. I'll give you this if you give me this. Exactly. Right? And, and when you don't get what you want. Yeah. Then what happens? Well, for me, I overgive. Yeah. I overgive I my, uh, my attention, my time, my, you know, my, everything, my efforts. And then what and does get, that leave you? It leaves me feeling like, oh, I gave, I put this much in and I'm not getting anything back. And it, it would, it would just weigh down on me and I would just become sad. And it was a terrible way to live day to day. Like, will this person make me happy today? Mm. Yeah. Where instead it should be, what am I going to do to make myself happy today? <laughs> That's a Oprah tweetable. That's a tweetable, everybody. <laughs> That's a tweetable, Jeff. Tweet that out. <laughs> you say, have my account. Log, say, I'll log in and tweet preach, that out. girl. Play that back. We're going to play that back a few times. Yeah. Woo! Here, repeat that. <laughs> girl. Yes. God, that's it. We have to pause and, and expand as a life coach. I simply can't gloss past that because that of like seeking your sources of significance from a man, most of us fall prey to that, from just general attention, from likes on social media, from all these other sources that give away our power because I depend upon it. If I don't get it, then it becomes this, this uncertainty, this panic, this emptiness, right, within us when in fact the shift becomes and it requires uncomfortable right to first you depend on the source now that source is gone oh right yeah. to sit in that kind of loneliness whatever it is to then figure out oh i have the power to make my to fill myself up and it is with self-love but i actually think that self-love is you know to practice gratitude is to get in touch with what makes you happy and then when you stop to explore, you know, what is that? What makes me feel good? And then realize, oh shit, I have the power to do that, yeah. right? To live this life, to continue to create this life, you know, that fills me up and be curious about where it's gonna lead. But like, that's the shift. Do it from within you. Okay, back to, <laughs> I'm off my soapbox. I love it. Back to my Oprah chair. <laughs> so. You're working on yourself, but I'm curious, what are you thinking at that point when it does come to like future relationships? Do you have this fear of like, oh gosh, yes, we is, talked I have to, some baggage. Yeah, absolutely. Does it feel like baggage? What is the state? Oh, yes. Uh, and I think I had about like five or six sessions with Joseph just on that. And the even though I was content with myself, I was still thinking about the future. Like I, I want kids one day. Right. I'm, I was actually very, like, very scared that I would never find anybody. And I think I, t I told him 
something very close to these lines. Like, I'm afraid that I will never find anybody who doesn't recognize me. And even if they do recognize me, isn't into my past. Yeah. Like, they're not into... I, I don't yeah. want somebody who's... Who He's wants that, that persona? Yeah, who wants that? Yeah, yeah. So you just thought like, oh gosh, I want this, but I don't really know how this is gonna work. Yeah. How that's possible? Yeah. yeah. And all Joseph told me was, "Why are you concentrating on that right now? That doesn't matter." Good job, yeah. Joseph. <laughs> is good life coach approved advice? Yeah, psychologist. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. And so then, what happened? Uh, I went <clears throat> on just living my life. Um doing things that made me happy and mm -hmm. things that made me happy was uh traveling with my friends mm -hmm. going to sporting events mm -hmm. uh watching sports um n still not leaving my house and I, I don't think that's just a uh, recluse thing i think i'm just i just like being at home yeah uh cooking for my friends mm -hmm. throwing dinner parties or brunches and having everybody over and feeding them and just enjoying my time with the people that I love and care about and who care about me as a person and not how many followers I have mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was just minding my own business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not looking for anybody because this was after uh, Joseph had like nailed it into my brain that I should not be looking for a relationship and I should not be worrying about if I'll ever find this person who doesn't know who I am. I found that person mm -hmm. and it happened in an instant and it clicked and he was halfway across the world mm -hmm. and we were just friends, like internet friends who flirted and it slowly grew over the course of, you know, three months until we both decided that, okay, there's, we never talked about it, we only talked about it a little bit, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy talking to you. Mm -hmm. His name's Robert, and he's my fiance he's now. He's a doll. He is. Um, so I flew to meet him in Copenhagen. Flew all the way there and spent 10 days with him, and it was the best 10 days of my life. And on the last day, uh, he, was, he was like, I'm not letting you get on that plane. You're my girlfriend, right? Oh. <laughs> and I was Robert. like, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh. But he, he was that person that I never thought I'd find. Yeah. Someone who uh, accepts my past and isn't into it. He didn't know who I was when I first started following him. Mm -hmm. I found him. You started following him? I did. I found him by accident. So I followed the Michelin Guide on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And the Michelin Guide posted about the restaurant he used to work at. And that took me to that restaurant's page. And they had posted a goodbye photo of him. So that took me to his page. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God. His food looks incredible. Everything he's <laughs> cooking looks incredible. And wow, he is so good looking. So I followed him. And because he didn't have, you know, that many followers, he had notifications turned on. And all of a sudden, his Instagram started blowing up. Because when I follow somebody, all of my followers can see that. So they start following them. Mm -hmm. um, and he finally, like, saw the little blue check mark. And he's like, who the fuck is this following me really? with 5 million followers? Like, who is this bitch? Uh, so he DM'd me and he said, Hey, like, hello. He's like, are you into food? And mm -hmm. I was like, well, I am. Yes, I am actually. And yeah, from there we started talking every single day mm. with a seven hour time difference. Mm -hmm. He was seven hours ahead of me and he would get off work around one in the morning and bike home as fast as he could. And then we'd FaceTime for an hour every mm. single night. Mm -hmm. So he sacrificed a lot of his sleep to talk to me and I would rearrange all of my plans so that I wouldn't be out of the house during that one hour that he could talk mm -hmm. and that's how we made it work for three months getting to know each other before mm -hmm. we both decided that it was time to finally meet mm. man that's exciting I've had a few of those situations that didn't play out that way <laughs> story for another time story for another time but okay do did you and he during that time like did you talk about your past yes. and or since then okay. yes yeah. um so i did i knew that he didn't really recognize me right or know who i was right uh so about three weeks into talking to each other every single day i realized i think i i, I really like this person mm -hmm. like he i love talking to him i love everything he has to say i love learning from him um 
So I want to be as open with him as possible before he thinks that I'm hiding something or before he reads something online that, you know, is probably wrong because most things online still claim that I do porn and I haven't done porn for five years. Mm -hmm. So one night I told him I needed to tell him something and I was too chicken shit to like say it face to face on FaceTime. Uh, so I messaged him and I basically gave him the entire backstory and he, he said, uh, well, I did Google you because I just wanted to know who you were. And I saw that it said that, but to be honest with you, I don't care. Like I have friends who used to be drug addicts who are now some of the best chefs in the world. Like everybody, everybody deserves a second chance and everybody has a past that they're not proud of. And I don't think anybody should be punished for wow. what they did in their past, no matter how old they were, which was like. When I saw that, I just started, and I'm really glad we weren't on FaceTime because I just started bawling my eyes out because I never thought I'd find anybody who was accepting of it that, that much and didn't care about it at all. Not because, you know, they thought porn was cool, right. but because they appreciated the efforts I've put in to try and put it behind me. Yeah. So that was... I mean, I've had the great privilege of meeting Robert, and I do think that he's an exceptional human. And that, and I think it takes an exceptional human to be able to see a human, right? Yeah. Not labels, not past, not job, not skin color. Like to be able to see the human being, you know, below <clears throat> the rest, I think takes a more evolved being. And I think that anybody who you know looks at and says oh porn <laughs> to me that is more a reflection of their own ignorance and insecurity and in fact showing their own shame yeah because psychologically speaking the only reason we judge anybody is because of our own yeah we judge ourselves right so the greater you know stuff you get from people the greater they're showing their own you know stuff and the fact that robert you know, could respond like he did, I think is just a true testament to, uh, to how spectacular of a person that he is. He's very rare. Yeah. But I also think that a lot of people can identify with women, especially with feeling like, gosh, like I'm not going to find somebody. There's nobody for me for whatever reason. Like for me and being, you know, 6'3", I intimidate a lot of guys and there's a lot of other stuff, you know, that's intimidating about me for you, for your own reasons. But you all this feeling of like, I'm not lovable. I'm not going to find, you know, my person for said reasons. And that's what I think part of shame is, right? Is this is a part of me that's not lovable, yeah. essentially, right? And I thought it was the biggest deal breaker and non-starter for a relationship ever. Yes. It was like, no one can top me. Yeah. <laughs> you went, well, yeah, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. yeah. But in fact, <clears throat> you know, like, what do what do you think happened in you when you saw Robert's message? Like, what do you think that did for your own healing, growth, and moving past this? It made me feel accepted. And even though we were nowhere near the L word, but it made me feel loved for who I am. Not what I've done, not anything else, but just me as a person. And the fact that he... Uh, appreciated everything I've done since then to try and right those wrongs or you know put it behind me or change people's perceptions of me meant so much that it, and sometimes this still gets me down and I just think back to you know if I can find a man like this like I can do anything and it's all of my efforts have been for something mm -hmm. it gets me so down when I get no's from companies because they don't want to work with me because of my past but you know I also thought I would never find a man like that so yeah. if one company says no to me yeah there's somebody out there who will want to work with me yeah yeah for sure it it motivates me yeah yeah my dad says stand back non-believers yeah and watch <laughs> yeah no I I'm glad that you I think that's phenomenal that you turned that into fuel and motivation where 
do you think you still have healing or growth around your past? Accepting it. I'm still not there yet. I might put on a facade like I have because, you know, I feel like fake it till you make it. But I definitely have not come to terms with it yet. I still, and this is something me and my manager fight about all the time. Mm -hmm. When people ask me for photos on the street, my answer is always, almost always, no. Because I've been, th there's nothing that'll make me feel more little than when I do say yes and the person walks away like, thanks, huge fan of your work. That just makes me feel dirty. Like I let this person into my personal space. You know, I gave them the satisfaction of having a photo with me. I don't know what they're gonna do with the photo, what caption they're gonna like post with the photo, who they're gonna send it to, what they're gonna say with it. Like I, I just made myself so vulnerable for the sake of being personable to people I don't even care about. Mm -hmm. So I have a belief that everything happens actually as it's supposed to. Okay, so just sit with this for a second. Because in the moment what can seem like the worst thing, right? Something really bad can actually, when you get more time and perspective, end up realizing how crucial a chapter, you know, it was. And that, you know, spiritually speaking, I believe that everything happens to help us grow, yeah. right? And evolve, to teach us something. What do you think was the lesson or learning or growth that came out of you doing porn? I think it was the people in my life now. That mm. is the best thing that came out of it. Because if I had never done porn, I would not have ever met Jeff. I would not have ever met Robert. I would not have ever met you guys, you and Joseph. I would not be in Austin. My entire life would be completely different and I would never trade any of those people in my life mm -hmm. for what could have been. All of the bad and everything I have to deal with is worth it because of the people in my life. Mm. Mm. And how do you think it has shaped and helped you grow personally? Oh, I think it has given me the thickest skin a person can have because... Death threats for my sis will do that to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's made me not sweat the little things. Anyone can insult me and it'll never offend me. Uh, anybody can say anything they want about me and it'll never offend me. Of course, some things do still right. get to me sometimes, right. but I do always compare it to like, all right, but are you ISIS? No. Are you going to kill me? No. Move on. No. Keep walking. But I actually think that's really he healthy, you know, to be able to have that, like, eh, it could be worse. Exactly. But in real life, yeah. it could be ISIS. This is like, people ISIS. tell me all the time, oh, my God, I've seen the comments on any picture you post on Instagram. Like, how do you deal with that? And my answer is always, like, I don't see them. Yeah. I don't get caught up in that. Yeah. I see comments from people I follow, and I see messages from people I follow, and I see absolutely nothing else. Mm. I mean, it's there. But I never have the urge to check it, to read it, to look at it. Never, ever. Mm -hmm. Because the only people, the only things that matter to me are the, are the things that the people I know have to say. Mm -hmm. So if, like, my friend Jenna tells me I look fucking ugly in a photo, that's when I'm like, oh, should I take that down? <laughs> yeah. But if, you know, insert name with a 69 at the end of it, user says oh god your nose is fucking huge like all right yeah who are you to judge me mm. who are you to judge me maybe hold a mirror for anybody watching yeah. this or whoever has judgment um yeah absolutely what do you think I i've always been fascinated about people's stories and stories in general um and i joseph campbell's big he's I don't know if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell's work, but he studied like the hero's journey and, and this general narrative story arc. And I think it's, it's really interesting to look at all of our lives, like where this hero's journey in our own right and have to go out, you know, and face these demons or Darth Vader or whatever it is, right, to learn and conquer and prevail. What do you think would be like the theme of your larger life story and what it is you have to conquer win make peace with i think it's with my own self in what capacity i have to fully 
accept and be comfortable with my past to the point where someone calling me a porn star doesn't bring me shame to where it can just roll off of me to where I don't respond the way I did in a radio interview Mm -hmm. uh, to where I can hold my composure and, you know, correct them without letting emotions get in the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the biggest thing standing in my way is myself. Yeah. Not anybody else. Yeah, for sure. And that usually goes the case, right? We're our own worst enemy. What do you think it would take to get to that place where, yeah, somebody could call you a porn star and you just words? It doesn't have an impact. More time. Hmm. Because five years later, uh, I'm doing this interview right now. Even six months ago, this never would have been on the table. Mm-hmm. I never would have considered it. Uh, I have said no to many interviews like this, countless. Mm-hmm. Every interview I've ever been asked to do has been about this and I've always said no to it yeah and if they weren't willing to change it and just make it about you know what project I'm working on at the time Mm -hmm. then it's just a straight up no it's Mm -hmm. not worth the exposure for me Mm -hmm. because I was not confident and comfortable enough with myself to talk about it Mm -hmm. uh, because I felt like the more attention I brought to it Mm -hmm. the more I would perpetuate the idea of me as a porn star which I, I'm trying to get past, but I can't do that unless I face it head on. Yes, exactly. And I think that even in doing this interview and, you know, and talking really intimately about the, the firsthand experience, I think that's healing in of itself, right? To bring it up and out and talk about it yeah. is a huge source of healing. And the more you do that, the more diffused it becomes, Yes. Yeah. right? Rather than when it's buried in this deep dark shame box, it holds a lot of power and darkness and controlling us. So even to put it out and say, yeah, this is it. Like, this is my shame. And to look at it takes huge lady balls and is, but that is, you know, like the salvation, I think, to our healing, to be able to look at, you know, in the eye and see and say, yeah, I did this. I'm not this, you know, because everybody is going to do something that they regret. And regret is not really something I'm into because again, I think in disguise, it all is happening as it's supposed to. Even things that were like, oh shit, I can't believe I did that or how hard or painful it was, but that ultimately becomes a part of the path um, is to be able to though look and say, look, I did this and I hold a lot of stuff around this and I actually fear that, that this is all I'll ever be known for and, you know, still that part of I'm not lovable for this. But yet for... Me, Joseph, Robert, anybody to say, yeah, good, I hear you, right? And I love you, right? Yeah. It doesn't change how, you know, I think or see you. Uh, I think that is where healing happens. And that anybody who doesn't respond like that is not about you, it's about their own exactly. stuff. Yeah? The thing that meant the most to me, or the gesture that meant the most to me, was when Jeff's family accepted me. Because if his family can just not even, you know, care about what I did in the past to the point where, you know, they just, you know, love me for who I am. Yes. I felt like that, that empowered me and made me, and made me feel lovable, not just to people my age who are a little more open-minded, but you know, someone's 45 year old mother. (laughs) (laughs) I love you, Miss Lori. (laughs) Yes. To, like when someone's mother can just accept me for who I am, that made me feel like, oh my God, it was like a, like a big sigh and a big breath that I could take at, that gave me hope for yeah. the future. Yes. Yeah, good. And I think that the more vulnerability is a word that most of us hate, right? But I actually think that that's the, you know, the cave that you fear most holds the salvation that you seek that like. The exposing yourself and be vulnerable to do this interview, right? It's incredibly vulnerable to open yourself up and say, this is the dark stuff. I'm scared about myself. And then to receive the love from Jeff's family, you know, from any evolved human uh, who loves themselves, who's done the work on themselves to be able to say, yeah, man, I've done some shit too. And we learn and we grow and we do the best we can with what we have at the time. Yeah. Right? I think that's an Oprah saying also. But we do the best we can with what we have at the time, truly. 
And sometimes that means porn. And sometimes that means one night stands. And sometimes that means like all sorts of things that we don't feel proud about. But I think there's a huge, a crucial difference between being proud about our past and feeling shame, right? You don't have to be proud of what you've done, everything you've done. Because if you're living big, if you're following your heart, if you're out there trying to learn and grow and, and figure yourself out, then shit, you're gonna fall. And you are gonna make some huge mistakes. And that that's part of life and how we grow. And the people who are gonna sling stones from their keyboards who aren't doing anything, right? You have nothing to say unless you're out there in the game, exposing yourself, trying, falling, looking at your own shit and demons and darkness to be able to see a human, right? A phenomenal human who's doing the same. <laughs> I love you. I love you. And so I, I, I agree with you. I think it's time, but I think it is talking about it. Like saying the words, the more you say the words, you know, the more it diffuses the power yeah. around it of kind of like the labyrinth. When they say, have you seen the labyrinth? Is that before your time? Is that the one with uh, Jennifer uh, Billy, Billy Idol? No, with... Um, with um, Sorry, David Bowie? Yes, David Bowie. Okay. And she Whatever. says... <laughs> it's the wedding singer. Oh. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> wow, that was really a generational divide here. Um, but she says, you have no power over me, right? Where like people no longer have power over you. The yeah. words no longer have power over you. Like, yes, this is something I did. This is not who I am. There is incredible power in the words, I am. Who would you say you are? I am a learning human. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I am. I, I, I mean, I'm 26. I still don't know who I am, but it's not in a way where I'm making bad decisions. It's just I'm learning more about myself every day, every week, every month, every year. Yeah. And, you know, if you ask me that in 10 years, I'll still say I'm still learning. Would you say that you love yourself? Yes. What does that mean to you? It means I know what I'm good at and I know that I am talented and smart and have a lot to offer. And even if it takes people a lot longer to see that because of their predisposed judgments, I still love myself. Mm -hmm. Good. What, how can you love yourself and not accept your past? That's, that's something I struggle with every day. Like I, you said you don't like the word regret, and I don't either, but it's very hard for me to say I don't regret porn. But at the same time, I wouldn't be where I am and have the people in my life that I do if it wasn't for that. So there's a sense of guilt that I, that I hold when I say I regret it, but it also feels wrong and like I'm lying to myself when I say I don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you can have an experience and have a whole slew of emotions around it and and yet still accept you know this was it's done to me first of all just on a practical level doesn't make sense to have regrets a waste of energy yeah. right uh it's happened so accept it it's done you can't rewrite it right it's done and so therefore the how do i make peace with this and and use the good from this from you know the platform from the opportunities from the relationships from here you know, I really think a person is defined not by their past, but by what they choose to do here and in moving forward. And the good news is that always exists. And so I'm curious, you know, what are your dreams? What, what would you love to see happen from here in your life? Uh, I definitely uh, want to grow my career. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do right now, what I want to do with that is different than what I want to be doing with that in, you know, five to 10 years when I have a family and kids. Mm -hmm. So right now it's just uh, focusing on my apps and uh, my Patreon and my site where I do photo shoots and I self sign posters and you know I do all of this stuff that relies on my image. Mm -hmm. Whereas in 10 years, I'd like to be doing something a little more uh, along the lines of consulting and teaching younger girls mm. how to 
be authentic on social media mm -hmm. because we live in a world where people are trying to be all of these other influencers that they see. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly believe in being yourself and not having an online persona that, you know, you think people want to see, but what people really want to see is just you, your personality, you raw, uncut, mm -hmm. no makeup. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you got to throw in some good looking photos in there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're not going to get anywhere, but mm -hmm. you also have to show people a real side of you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is, is the power of that authenticity. Yeah. It's not the pretty veneer, right? All the time. It's like the raw, real that people respond and connect to. I just hope to further emphasize that like your, who you are now, the raw and real is also a product of everything you have experienced in your life. That's who you are, right? Is that you are a product of your experiences that it has helped shape and mold you, not define you. you. Can't control. It's done. But what it means to you now, right, and who you choose to be, but that's part of like this raw authenticity. You know, is, yeah, some stuff has happened. It's an unconventional path, but being able to choose and write. You know, this is who I am and this is who I'm choosing to be and what I'm moving forward towards. What do you, uh, what would be like if your message to little girls, like what would you want to give them that would make them better moving forward, growing up? Don't do porn. <laughs> Don't ever do porn. Yes. Don't go anywhere near a stripper pole. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it would be, I mean, and this is so cookie cutter, but love yourself. Mm. And it's hard to tell little girls that because it took me until I was 25, 20, like 24 to really start applying and, you know, actively trying to do that myself. But just don't, don't rely on men or anybody else for your happiness. Or for your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that way, going back to the life story and like the theme and what you had to learn, like that's it for you. Like look at all the experiences yeah. and even seeking the attention, the validation, even through an exaggerated example like porn. Yeah. It's just an exaggerated example of seeking, you know, an external solution to an internal exactly. problem. Exactly. Some girls post scantily clad photos on uh, Instagram for validation through likes. And some people take it to an extreme, like porn. Yeah. Yep. And the same way of being able to be authentic, like your message and, and the power of that. Um, but with that, I can show myself without makeup and I can show the things about my life and my past that I'm not the most proud of. And yet still, I love myself, right? Still, I am enough. Yeah. That's really it, right? The message that comes through vulnerability. Yeah. Oh my God, it takes a lot of vulnerability to get the there. vulnerability of willing to be uncomfortable to show yourself, right? But I think, and even for you, the more people can see that and who you really are, and hopefully through this interview, um, yeah, to get to know you and, uh, and in moving forward and who you continue to learn and grow and evolve to become. Mm, good. Anything else that you wanted to say? Oh, I think I've said a lot. You said a lot. A lot more than I have ever said. Ah, well, I appreciate you trusting me. In uh, yes. Too. And th I think that's uh, that was the biggest uh, catalyst that made me uh, want to do this was the fact that I'm comfortable with you. And I know you wouldn't, you know, lead me in the wrong direction or judge me for anything I had to say. No. No. Yeah. And I, again, I said it before, I think it's healing for you to tell your story, but I also think it's really healing. As a life coach, I got excited for people to see, because like I said, we all have shame. Yours is an exaggerated example. That is in the public eye, whether you try to hide it or not, right? It's the known elephant in the room. And to be able to say, hey guy, I see you, right? And we're moving forward, we're marching this way, is a, is a powerful thing. So thank you for being brave enough. Thank you for giving me the tools to be. You're welcome. cocaine like 11 <laughs> times oh god <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was a Lindsay Lohan joke. I don't do cocaine. <laughs> Are these one of these things that you told me that I shouldn't say? No. Okay. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> the official drink of Texas. <laughs> yeah. All right.